All right, let's go ahead and begin. Um, we'll start our study today with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your word. We thank you for the gift uh, that it is to our church. Today, especially, we thank you for the spirit that you've given us uh, as your church body. And we pray especially for those uh, to whom you have called to share your word and to care for your church. Uh, we ask that our study this morning would help encourage and um, open our minds to this gift that you give us in the pastoral office. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, so this morning, uh, if you look at your, your handout, the, the title that we're, we're dealing with today is The Office of Public Ministry and the Priesthood of All Believers. So we've been kind of talking about um, the, the call and the office of the pastor the past couple weeks. We'll, we'll do it again today. Um, we'll pick it up again next fall. We're hoping to do a little more detail and, and in a study in the fall. Uh, during the summertime, so that starts next weekend, is Memorial Day weekend already. So next weekend we'll begin a series on the Proverbs. So just doing different Proverbs and, and lessons from the Proverbs throughout um, June and July. But when we get back to um, our kind of normal schedule again in August and September, uh, again, we're hoping to spend a little more time looking at this um, call process. And it's, of course, a timely thing for us now um, as our church is in the middle of a, a call process and, um, well, I shouldn't say middle, probably towards the beginning and, and getting ready to um, make a call. And so uh, just a couple quick refresher notes from what we've done so far this month. If you uh, have or haven't been here, you'll know uh, we spent some time in the first week with Pastor Kyle talking about uh, how pastors are called by God's spirit and, and responding to his uh, authority as a representative of the church. And then uh, last week, Pastor Matt talking about um, how the call actually becomes a thing for a specific individual, how a congregation issues a call to a pastor uh, to do these pastoral duties of preaching and administering the sacraments. And so today, uh, we're going to take that kind of and go a little bit further into um, the tension and the balance, maybe it's a better word than tension, the balance between uh, the laity and the clergy. So this has been something that's kind of been a part of our, our Lutheran Church Missouri Synod uh, since its inception, this question of who has the ultimate authority in the congregation, the people or the pastor, um, and, and how do they interact with each other. So um, there's a couple key terms on the front of your handout. Again, if you didn't grab one of these half sheets, you want to do that before you, uh, we get going. But the, the few key terms to look at there, we'll, we won't read all of these, but we'll read a few uh, of these Bible passages to kind of help us lay a, a ground level f uh, for our discussion. So the office of the public ministry, right? That, that first thing to know is the office of the public ministry refers, refers specifically to the office of the pastor, right? And so uh, the church takes a representative, a pastor, and gives them the authority to preach, to minister sacraments, uh, and to care for the flock. And there's lots of, obviously, lots of uh, passages in the New Testament that talk about people being pastors and caring for the church. Um, one of those there is Ephesians, and that speaks specifically to um, the fact that God gave apostles, teachers, shepherds, evangelists, and, you know, down the list. Again, uh, the wording there is that God gave these things to the church. So this is a gift from God. The office of the pastoral ministry is a gift from God to the church. And then it continues on um, in verse 12 of Ephesians 4 to say, the purpose of that gift is to equip the saints for ministry. So there's already a, there's already a, a, a balance set up there in Ephesians, at least in these verses, that, um, that say, yeah, God gives the pastoral office as a gift, but the purpose of that gift is to build up and to equip the the congregation, the saints, for good works. Uh, someone asked about this a couple weeks ago, uh, the office of the keys. This is kind of foundational to what we're talking about today. And anybody remember back to your catechism days, the office of the keys uh, is associated with what part of the catechism that you learned in confirmation? Mia's the most recent confirmand in the room, so she might be on the spot here. No one else can remember the office of the keys. Anybody, anybody uh, rec recall? Confession absolution, absolutely right. So confession absolution. Let's go ahead and look up um, at least Matthew 16, verse 18 and 19. So go ahead and if you've got a Bible, uh, we'll look up Matthew 16, 18 and 19. There are some Bibles in the back if you want to grab one by the door there. Uh, and this, is, this verse, especially from Matthew, 
is the foundation for where we get this doctrine of the office of the keys. And it, like I said, this, this office of the keys is going to kind of lay the foundation uh, for what we call the priesthood of all believers. So who would be willing to read for us from Matthew uh, 16? I'll give you a microphone. Thanks, Dave. And I tell you, you are Peter. This rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Perfect. I will give you the keys to heaven, right? That idea that um, Jesus gives away this authority of the church. And specifically, that authority is for forgiveness, right? Whatever you bind on earth, so whatever you choose not to forgive will be not forgiven. Whatever you choose to loose, whatever you choose to let free can be forgiven. Now, uh, some churches in history, and especially uh, the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church, took this uh, passage and they kind of saw this handing down of the keys from Jesus to Peter, that, you know, on this rock I will build my church, and so that's where they get this idea of what's called apostolic secession, in that Jesus gave this ministry, this office of the keys, to Peter. So literally like we would give a, a like, if you did something great, the mayor would give you a key to the city. This is the idea that Jesus gives that, like, keys to the kingdom to Peter, and then Peter passes that on to the next disciple or whoever he chose to, to represent him, and then that person passes it down, and, and so on, where um, there's still an office in the Roman Catholic Church, the bishopric of Rome, otherwise known as the Pope, which the Catholic Church holds is in line with this succession. That the, the Pope today can trace this authority to, to have a church from this very word of Christ to Peter in Matthew 16. Now, uh, the Lutherans don't hold to that, right? There was some disagreement about Martin Luther about the authority of the Pope and the primacy of the Pope. He wrote a little thing about that. Um, but we, we, uh, we have this idea then that this was not just given to Peter, right, even though he does name Peter specifically, but that this authority is given to all disciples, right, all who have the Spirit uh, and live in the Spirit, that we have the authority to forgive sins. Now, this is, this is huge. Um, the other b- verse that uh, really gets to this is John chapter 20, and oftentimes we read this at Easter time because it is an Easter time verse. Um, but to set the scene, Jesus just spent how many years with his disciples before he goes to the cross and offers himself as a sacrifice, right? He gives his own body and blood for our forgiveness. And then he finds the disciples, and where does he find the disciples after Easter? In a locked room, hiding. Okay, so they're doing great, following his words, right, instructions. Um, and he shows up, and he says... Peace be with you. Receive the Holy Spirit. Whatever you forgive, is if I've, it's as if I've had forgiven it myself. Now, Jesus just spent his own body and blood to earn that forgiveness. And then he turns around and just says, here you go. Have some forgiveness and, and go give it out, right? It's, it's free. Which should make us stop and go, wait, wait a minute. You just paid the ultimate price for this and now you're going to hand it out for free? I mean, this is completely upside down to the way the world thinks about forgiveness and earning forgiveness and we, what we call this kind of transactional religion that most people think, I, if I want God, God to you know, have favor on me, I need to kind of be a good person and do the right things. And Jesus says, no, I died for that. It's yours, right? You don't have to do anything to earn it. You don't have to do anything. Um, I'm just going to give it away. And he's by that trying to show us that we too are to give that kind of forgiveness away, right? That we are to be like Jesus in forgiving and, and least loosing the sins of others. Now again, there's been some interpretive disagreement to whether Jesus only gives that power of forgiveness to only those 12 disciples in that one room or to the whole church. Um, the Lutheran church has sided on the, the side of it's for the whole church, right? And that's where we get this doctrine of the office of the key. So from our catechism, uh, it says, what is the office of the keys? It says, Christ has given this to his church the authority to forgive sins or to withhold forgiveness. This authority works like a key to open heaven by forgiving sins or to close heaven by not forgiving them. 
And this is a special God-given way of applying the gospel to the individual. So again, that's straight out of our, our catechism, that we have authority simply by being members of Christ's church that is pretty special, that comes from Christ himself. So that sets us up for the idea of the priesthood of all believers, uh, that all of us, okay, in simple terms, right, it kind of speaks for itself, all believers are part of a priesthood because we have this authority from Christ, from the office of the keys, to forgive sins. But there's some other um, kind of texts throughout the Bible that also point to this. So let's look up a few of these different passages um, and we'll kind of read them in quick succession. So someone find Exodus 19 for me and be ready to read that. Who's going to be my Exodus reader? Thank you, Pastor. Someone with 1 Peter 2 who can read 1 Peter 2 for me. Thank you, John. And then um, Romans 12. I just got that one, and Revelation 5. Thank you, Kim. All right, so we'll I'll try to remember that order. But go ahead and just uh, find those passages and just read them. And what we're listening for is what authority does, or what uh, special uh, title do these passages give to give and say, and to whom? So we're listening to who gets the title and what title is it. Go ahead. This... Is, is it on? Okay. I could just use my pastor voice, and I wouldn't need a mic, but that's okay. Uh, now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possessions among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you, sh you shall be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. All right, so what authority or title and to whom is it given? Real quickly. Priest. Given the title of priest, you should be a kingdom of priests. And who is that spoken to? The whole people of Israel, right? That the entire nation of Israel, this is verses before God gives the Ten Commandments. Uh, and so Moses is hearing these words, but it's meant for it to be shared and spoken to the entire nation of Israel. That all of these people who have been taken out of Egypt through the Exodus are to be a kingdom, so you're setting up a, like a, already a certain parameter around what they are, a kingdom of priests. Go ahead, read the next one uh, from first, first Peter. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. All right, wonderful. So again, what's the title or uh, special designation given here? A royal priesthood. Does it sound familiar? Does it sound at all like the Exodus verse? A little bit. The, the treasured possession, the chosen race. Uh, again, this is God acting with his people saying, I'm, I have something special for you, for his people in mind. And now this is written in 1 Peter, okay? After Jesus has done everything, raised from the dead, ascended back to heaven, the disciples have been out, you know, doing their thing, spreading the word. So this message is not written now only to a certain ethnicity or a certain group of tribes that came out of Egypt. This message is now being broadened to who? The whole world, right? I mean, this message is available to anyone who would call themselves a disciple of Christ. That at this point, anyone who finds himself saying, wow, this Jesus, this is amazing, and there's something about him that I need to be a part of. This, this is a title of the royal priesthood is available to anyone there, right? That he has called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light, and we are to proclaim his excellencies. Now, the word proclaim is often associated with what kind of pastoral action proclaim something the forgiveness of sins we proclaim the forgiveness of sins and also to preach right the proclamation of the gospel so the two things or two of the, the very key things to what the pastor does are also here described as a function of all of God's people okay uh, who had the next verse we have Romans 12 I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, 
by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. All right. You may discern the will of God. So again, who is this for and what kind of um, special title or authority are they given? Again? Yeah, for everyone, for brothers, right? He's writing to the church at Rome, but implying that everyone in that church is a part of this command, right? That brothers, you all have this uh, ability to offer yourselves as a spiritual worship. Now, again, think if you think of the role of the priest in the Old Testament, one of the major functions of the priest in the Old Testament was to offer sacrifices, right? To atone for the sins uh, before we have the final atonement in Christ, to atone for the sins of the people by offering sacrifices on a daily and you know, hourly kind of basis, right? And Paul is saying here, that's all of us now. We have this role of offering sacrifices, not because we need to atone for sins, because Christ has done that, but that we offer ourselves, our own bodies, in spiritual worship to Christ, right? In service to him through our service to one another. Um, again, yeah, it's written to everybody, okay? So let's listen to uh, the final passage. You had the, Kim had the Revelations verse. This is going to sound similar to the Exodus verses as well. They sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take this world and open its seals, because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. All right, so this one's... Uh, pretty clear. Again, every tribe, every, king, every nation, every tongue is going to be part of this um, collection that God is making for himself of his people. And, and the last few words, what are they going to do? They're going to reign on the earth, right? They're going to be a kingdom, okay? So having a kingdom implies that you have a king and some kind of like a governmental structure kind of, um, or sorry, king here would be Jesus, and that we're going to reign, that, that God's people are being prepared for a life on earth where they have this special authority. And of course, uh, again, the special authority to forgive sins. Uh, so that's what the priesthood of all believers is. It, seems, it should seem pretty clear to us that this is not an accident to the New Testament, that, you know, those verses from Exodus that are copied again in Peter and Revelation um, are, are part of God's design from the beginning, that God's people were always supposed to be partners with him in offering forgiveness and sharing his mercy and representing him to the world, right? Just that the nation of Israel didn't quite work that way. The, the whole test, Old Testament history is examples of how they don't do those things until finally Christ comes along. But that's what we're supposed to be. And again, it applies, it's expanded in the, in the New Testament, not just to the nation of Israel, but to all people through Christ. So, um, real quick, just to define, so we're on the same page, the church as well. Um, the church is where word and sacrament are present, right? That's what we get in our catechism, that God's word and his forgiveness of sins through the sacraments um, make the church, right? And of course, we have to have people gathered around those things, right? The, the word for church um, in Greek, the ekklesia, right, comes from the word assembly. So it, it, you have to have a group of people to make this thing actually a church, uh, in addition to the word and sacrament. So, back to we get to this, okay, so what really is a church? Can you, can you have a pastor who doesn't have a church and he'd still be a pastor? Or conversely, could you have a church that doesn't have a pastor and still be a church? Right, some of these questions have been asked throughout history and, and, and which makes the thing the church, right? Which, which authority, either the, from the pastor or from the congregation, um, is really the, the ultimate authority here. This goes back through um, a lot of our history in the LCMS. Now, if you want to do some um, thick reading on this, the book is called Zion on the Mississippi, um, and it goes in detail about the, the history of the founding of the Lutheran Church of Missouri Senate. But the brief, I'll, get, I'll give you a couple highlights of it. There's been this tension in, in our Lutheran Church body between the authority of the pastor and the role of the congregation 
because from the very beginning, there, that was the conflict. So Martin Stephan is a, a German, Austrian-German pastor uh, from, from Germany who in the mid-1800s uh, was feeling more pressure from the German state church, right? He was feeling like he couldn't say the things he wanted to uh, because of the German state church wanted him to say some different things, right? So he wanted to be a little more true to what the Bible said. So he said, let's go to America. Now, there's a side note on that is that some historians think that he was more interested in going to America because he was trying to escape accusations of sexual misconduct in Germany and that he might have faced uh, a defrocking in Germany if he had stayed much longer. So just keep that in mind. So he gets to America with this group of, uh, there, there are five ships of German Lutherans that left Germany. Four of them made it to the, the Mississippi River through the Gulf of Mexico. And on the way, uh, right before they were about to land, uh, Martin Stephan says, you know, it'd be really great if you all would just call me your bishop, and then we can really kind of set up our little colony of Lutheranism here and do things the right way if I'm the bishop and you all just listen to me. And so they signed the paper, the, the people on the ship, uh, the, there were four um, kind of sub-pastors under Martin Stephan who said, that sounds good. They signed the paper, uh, a couple of people did too. And that's what they started doing. They set up this little colony in Perry County, Missouri. Anybody ever been to Perry County before? Matthew Douglas, yes. Did you take a trip in the seminary? Did they make you down, go down to Perry County? Yeah. It's the, it's the Jamestown of the Lutheran Church, right? Um, but of course, remember, this is the 1850s, so a couple hundred years after that. Um, so they, they settle this colony, things are going pretty decently, you know, they start to um, build their little towns and, and divide their spaces out, and they have pastors in, in their local villages uh, for their churches. But this bishop, Martin Stephan, um, they, people start to have issues with him because he's becoming a little more, um, well, the one word, I, one of the things I read called him iron-fisted, that, you know, things have to be done this way. It has to be done my way, or it's not really the right way. And um, then there were more suspicions. Uh, there was this whole, um, why is he taking young women on long walks question. And eventually, uh, one of the other pastors in the community preached a sermon about the Sixth Commandment that um, made three or four different women from the congregation come forward and say, this, this isn't right. I've been sinning with this bishop. And so that broke down the whole structure of the church. I mean, everything was kind of like, what do we do? Our, our, our main leader, who we've almost, in essence, sworn allegiance to, uh, now we, we're not sure we, we can follow him anymore. But we still believe all the stuff that he was teaching and the stuff that we have from the Lutheran uh, tradition. You know, we still believe the confessions and the Bible and all this stuff, but we have this person that we don't want to follow anymore. So one of the pastors um, who was under him and had signed that paper on the, on the ship is C.F.W. Walter, right? He's uh, the first president of the LCMS uh, Senate. And so he um, and some others kind of try to help clean things up and, and keep things going in the church because, again, they believe, too, the confessions in the Bible. And so um, if you flip your, your handout there, on the backside of your handout, there's a series of theses that Walter ends up writing. And these theses are specifically about the role of the pastor and the role of the congregation. Because there was this thing of, well, if, if Bishop Stephan has called him, he's a bishop now, who's, who can take that away from him? Because he's the leader of the church and he's kind of got that like unilateral authority. So how do we, how do we deal with something like that? Um, and so the, eventually the, the LCMS, the Lutheran Church, originally called the Lutheran Church a Synod of Missouri, Ohio, and other states, something like that. It was a whole collection of Midwestern states that were listed, been simplified now to Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. Uh, this founded in 1847, so within six years of all that uh, disagreement and conflict. Then in 1851, so just a few years after this, and this is like early part of the church history for us, Walter writes these theses. And I've highlighted a few of them there for you. There's 10 of them, I gave you some samples. But number one, the pastoral office is distinct from the priestly office which belongs to all believers. They're already setting out this doctrine in the priesthood of all believers that all people have a special authority, right? That we, 
want to hold on to the fact that we are not going to be a church where there's only a pastoral office that sets things down. However, number three, the church has been commanded to establish a pastoral office and is ordinarily bound to it until the end of days. So we, we can't get away without a pastor, but we still have the special authority as a congregation. Number four, the pastoral office is not set up over and against the common Christian, but it is an office of service. So we're already hearing, we can like hear the echoes of uh, the conflicts from a few years ago, right, for him, that, yeah, we, we should have a pastoral office, but the role of that office is not to dominate the church, but to serve the church, right? So we think of, uh, instead of the regular business hierarchy where you've got a CEO on top and a few um, executive council that reports to him, and it, you know, that's our common understanding of business, and that should be flipped upside down, right? The, the pastor serves the church is in the top of the church. Uh, number six, or number seven, excuse me. The pastoral office is conferred by God through the congregation. The congregation as holder of the priesthood and of all church power to administer in public office the common rights of the spiritual priesthood on behalf of all. Okay, so that can be a confusing sentence, but what we're saying basically is the congregation, again, is the holder of this priesthood and of all church power. The congregation has that power. But to administer in public office, we call a pastor to do these things for the, the common rights of the spiritual priesthood on behalf of all, right? So in, in essence, that in order to kind of keep things moving in a church and, and to keep things ordered, we need to have pastors to administer the sacraments, to preach, to um, know their doctrine so they can preach uh, encouraging and actually biblical sermons. Uh, we, we need these people to be um, set apart in a way, and yet their authority and their role isn't unique as much as it's just a function of the authority and role of the whole congregation. Number nine, reverence and unconditional obedience is due to the minister of preaching when the preacher is ministering the word of God. Okay, so I mean, again, still pretty clear that there's a role of the pastor that needs to be part of the church, and that is do the respect uh, that like Paul talks about in the book of Titus and Timothy. However, the preacher may not dominate over the church. So do you see where this tension is coming, right? There's this like, the preacher has this role, the congregation has the authority, we need to balance those things, right? And there's a clear need uh, because of what had happened in their history to, to find that balance. And number 10, the laymen also have the right of excommunication in establishing doctrine. And for this reason, they also have a seat and vote with preachers in the church courts and councils. And so we actually see this as a direct thing um, in our, the way our Senate operates today. When we have a convention as a Senate, the National Senate, uh, each church, each congregation sends a, pr a pastor and a layperson to vote, right? So there is not necessarily, uh, if the Senate decides something um, about, let's say, the role of women in the pastoral office, you know, Senate could change that kind of thing at convention. But it's not going to be only the pastors who get to decide that, right? The lay people have a role in that kind of vote too. And we've seen in other synods, particularly like the ELCA, uh, they had some real issues with that in, in their decisions to allow homosexuals in the ministry. Um, and the way those decisions were made, that was really harmful to a lot of small town congregations that didn't feel like they had a voice in that thing. Um, and so we have that balance in the LCMS. Um, now, if you compare that against some, to make some more, more comparisons, um, not necessarily good or bad, but to think about the way that the Lutheran Church has set up the call system, that we have this balance of authority and that the congregation is autonomous enough to decide who it's going to call, and this is a unique thing in American Christianity. So, for example, um, the Episcopal Church or the Anglican Church, uh, they use bishops and, and those kinds of roles in their, their hierarchy in the church. And so if uh, you are serving as a rector or a, or a priest at a, an Episcopal church, that role, your service there, is only so long as your bishop, you know, state or regional or whatever, uh, decides it is. Because at any moment they could say, you're moving from Avon to Columbus, Ohio. Or, um, yeah, that person we had down in Seymour, we need them in Timbuktu. It just is really all over the place, right? And they get assigned. Uh, in the Methodist, some Methodist churches, uh, they have what they call sendings, and, and those are even um, 
within like a region, so again, like the Indiana State uh, region for the Methodist Church or whatever, they would have, they have a group of a committee that meets every January and reviews all the pastoral assignments and says, these ones are okay, we'll leave them there, and these 20 we're gonna change. Every year, they review all those things. So you're serving as a pastor in one of those churches, but you, you, you need to set down some roots in order to do effective ministry, and yet at the same time, how permanent do you feel your roots are going to be? There's always this kind of thing hanging over your head of, but maybe I'll just be reassigned next month. You know, and and that, that creates, a, uh, I think, a, a difficult place for a pastor to be, especially, and for the congregation. If you end up in a congregation where the, the regional office has changed your pastor three times in the last five years, that doesn't feel great either, right? And maybe you don't feel like you want to get to know this pastor very well because they're just going to be gone in two years anyway. Now, all that said, there are definitely places where people do have longevity in ministry in those churches. It's not that every Episcopal priest has moved around every two years, just that they can be, right? On the flip side, kind of the far extreme from that, is the completely autonomous congregation. So some Baptist churches or uh, a lot of non-denominational churches today in America um, operate without any kind of affiliation with the Senate or a district office or a... uh, a regional office or any of that kind of thing. And so it's just truly the people who show up on Sunday morning and come to that voters meeting, or in some cases, not even that, but the people who sit on the board of elders in a church who say, we kind of liked what that guy said, so we'll hire him for our pastor. Or we really didn't like what that guy said, so he's out, right? And, and it becomes this uh, sensitive thing of um, a pastor maybe doesn't feel like he has the complete freedom to say the things he might need to or feel called to say because he's got a family to feed, he's got uh, an income he wants to preserve, and that sets up a difficult structure too. Now again, there's lots of churches where that works and, and that's, that's fine. This is all, none of this is prescribed in the Bible, right? But the LCMS has a, a unique balance between those two kinds of extremes uh, in the way that we deal with our pastors and that we have an autonomous congregation that calls pastors, and if in certain situations there are clear um, examples of when we can rescind a call as a congregation. So if we feel a pastor has been unfaithful to our doctrine, we can rescind a call. If we feel a pastor has been um, unfaithful in the way he lives a Christian life, we can rescind that call. But we also can't just uncall someone that uh, changed the color of the paint in the sanctuary, right? There's, there's, there's a, a, a line there, right? So at the same time we have autonomy as a congregation, there's a limit to that. Also, on the pastoral side, we believe that pastor does uh, deserve reverence and obedience and that they do um, have this authority to forgive sins and publicly pr- represent the church uh, in the sacraments and the preaching. However, the pastor is not to serve in the role of like a bishop or that kind of dominating um, example that, that Walter's talking about where they would come in and say, this is how it has to be done. We have to do things this way. We've set our doctrine, right? There's, there's again, some, some balance and protection in the way that we've uh, set up that whole system. So it's, it's, quite a, uh, it's quite a history here and there's quite a lot of give and take, right? And it's not always, cl- it's, it seems really clear when we read these and we think about it on maybe comparison to the extremes, uh, but it's not always super clear in the particulars, right, when we get to a particular church and a particular call uh, for a pastor. So, any comments or thoughts before we, we move on to the last section for today? Any just, is that new for people? Had anybody heard that history before or uh, been familiar with that tension in the, in the Lutheran church? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting because uh, the, the history of our, ch- our church body is not a secret. It's pretty well documented. Um, and yet it's not, it's, it's funny because we're not really proud of that. At the same time, hopefully the Senate has really learned a lesson from that and has this system that's unique uh, in part because of our history. Yeah.
Right. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good point. That the, the Lutheran Church is so unique in the way we do the call process that, especially if you've grown up in another church tradition, this seems especially strange. And 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 really, there is a part where the call process, uh, because it um, happens so independently, because it's not like the district president is going to call up a pastor and say, you know, I I think I'm going to move you next month. So just give you a heads up, right? It can be so immediate as you open up the mailbox and here's a call document from a church, in Pastor Matt's case, last year it was uh, somewhere in Oregon, right? It, yeah, it just, you know, it, it comes out of nowhere, right? And, and maybe they give you a little bit of heads up. Nowadays, sometimes you'll do a call or a, a short interview ahead of time. But still, in some cases, you just get the call document and you've got a call now that you have to decide within two weeks, by the way, are you going to move your whole life or not? So this, this still is, it, it, when you say it that way, it seems really strange, right? Um, and, and that is not convenient necessarily for pastors, but it does allow room for the spirit to work in both sides of the process, where the congregation is praying and asking for the spirit's guidance and choosing its next pastor, and then the called pastor is praying and asking for the Spirit's guidance in choosing between the calls that he has in front of him to the congregation he serves and to the congregation that might be calling. Yeah? In order to receive that call, mm-hmm. does the pastor believe Yeah, so particularly nowadays in the Lutheran Church, um, there's a system, I, they've changed the acronym, so I can't remember it right now. Um, there's a, a, an online database, essentially, of all rostered, um, LCMS workers. And so even like someone like Amy and, and I am on this list because we're called. Uh, and so if you went to the LCMS website, you look up my name, you'll find me. Um, and if you're working through the district president, you can see that I have a short biography. I have uh, a couple questions I've answered about my approach to ministry. Uh, and then I've checked the box that says open to receive a call. Now, there are some situations where I personally believe you can check that box that says, no, I'm not interested in a call. But For the most part, my general philosophy is the way the call process works, we have to leave room for the Holy Spirit. And so I have on my my, uh, profile that I'm open to receiving a call. Now, especially right now with a one-month-old baby at home, that's not convenient. (laughs) I don't intend to take a call anytime soon. uh, And I I like working here. It's It's a great family of God. However, if I'm gonna always decide when it's good time for me to take another job, is that really listening to the Holy Spirit? I don't think so. So I have to leave myself open, I believe, to that possibility that if a church decides that my gifts or my skills or the things they've seen in in my resume or profile fit their needs, that they can call me and I have to leave space that that might be the place where God is assigning me. Again, assigning in the sense that God is calling me there, not that I'm being put there. Um, So there's there's this openness kind of and, and a little bit of gray area that like, yeah, that could come out of nowhere um, and I, again, I, I think that's how, you, how it should be done. Now, other people will say, no, I've got different reasons for marking myself as not interested or seeking a call, because I think there's three different check boxes. You can do um, not interested, open to receiving a call, or actively seeking a call. Um, and so that might be someone who, like Terry, you said, like you move and you know, you've got a job, but your husband's still looking for a call because he didn't find anything in that area. Yeah. Yeah, so if you want to talk to, I was uh, preparing for this and I talked to uh, Mark Borcherding a little bit this week. 
He had at one point in his life four different calls um, where he had been serving at a church in Fremont, Nebraska. Two churches from Texas and a church from, I think, California called him at the same time. You know, he's sitting there opening up mail and it's just got like three different letters and he's like, what do I do now? You know, like, and, but he said at the same time he had actually um, turned down a call a, a month or two previous to that. And so he gets now all of these different calls and he says, oh, okay, God, I think you're telling me something. And so he actually did take one of those calls to Texas. Um, you're right, where, where God is speaking through some of those ways the church, right? And so there's this um, wonderful thing, and we'll close with this because we're almost out of time, um, that the Holy Spirit does, right? We celebrate the Holy Spirit today in Pentecost, but the Holy Spirit is at work, hopefully, and, and theoretically, with our, our doctrine says, in the congregations and in the pastors, right? And the balance works between the, the authority of the congregation and the authority of the pastor when both of those entities are trusting in God's guidance through the Spirit, right? When both of those entities are praying and seeking God's will uh, in all things through those calls and through their service. So thanks for, thanks for being here. Um, if you, uh, I guess, take your hand out. There's a couple more things we didn't touch on if you want to read through those. And if you want a really thick and detailed um, official document on the ministry and the call process and that kind of stuff, I have extra copies of these that Pastor Matt made for us. So I've got some of those if you want them. Otherwise, next week, our Bible study will um, move on to a th series in the Proverbs over the summertime, and so we'll uh, see you then for that. Have a wonderful week, and uh, God's blessings.